Okay, this chapter actually begins a whole new series of problems where we actually use derivatives to answer questions about functions. So we're going to learn a lot of neat stuff in this uh, chapter, this chapter 3, Applications of Derivatives. Let's talk about a little bit about increasing and decreasing functions. A function is actually increasing when the graph moves upward as x increasing and it's decreasing if the graph moves downward as x decreases. And of course it's constant if it stays the same. So if you look at this piece down here, as you go, as x gets larger, the graph gets higher and higher. So this part of the graph would be increasing. So we would say f is increasing on that interval, negative infinity to 1. And then, but when you go from here to here, the graph is actually staying constant. So when you go from x equal 1 to x equal 5, the graph is going to be constant. So we would say the graph is constant on 1 to 5. And then we would say the graph is decreasing on this piece, which goes from 5 to 7. So we would say the graph is decreasing on 5 to 7. Um, this is a formal definition. Basically, a function is increasing over an interval. Uh, if you have two x values, x1 and x2, if when x1 is greater than x2, then f of x1 is also greater than f of x2. A better way to say that might be if the x1 is greater than x2, then y1 will be greater than y2. So, in other words, as the x gets bigger, the y's get bigger. If the function is decreasing, then we can say if we have these two numbers, x1 and x2 in the interval, then as x1 gets bigger, in other words, when x1 is bigger than x2, then f of x1, which would be the y value, y1, would actually be less than y2. So in other words, as the x, x's get bigger, the y's get smaller. And then for the function to be constant on an interval, as x gets bigger, as x1 gets bigger than x2, then the y values stay the same. Now, most of the time we're going to be talking about functions that are increasing or decreasing. Um, there are some cases where we might have a function that's constant over a certain interval, but mostly we'll be dealing with increasing and decreasing. Okay, now before we can talk about figuring out where a function changes from increasing to decreasing, we need to talk about critical numbers. So let's talk about, let's look at the definition of a critical number. If f is defined at x equals c, and this part right here is important, because if the function's not defined at x equals c, then you can't have a critical number there because that value would not be in the domain. But let's say f is defined at x equals c, then c is a critical number if the derivative is zero, or if the derivative is undefined. Okay, so let's let's look at um, three examples. Okay, now I'm not going to spend time finding the derivatives. You can you can actually practice on these uh, on your spare time because we've already covered that chapter. So let's say f of x is 4x cubed minus 6x squared. Well, then its derivative would be 12x squared minus 12x. So what we want to do to find critical numbers is we want to find where this function is undefined or where it's zero. Well, polynomial functions are defined for all real numbers, so we're not going to have any issues where this function is undefined. So we're only going to focus on where the derivative is zero. So let's find what values make this derivative equal zero. Now we can do that. All we do is set this equal to zero and then solve the equation. So if I set 12x squared minus 12x equal to 0, so set the derivative equal to 0, and then solve that equation. I can factor a 12x out, so I get 12x times x minus 1 equals 0. Then if I set 12x equal to 0, the only way that's going to be true is if x is 0. And then if I set x minus 1 equal to 0, the only way that's going to be true is if x is 1. So those are the critical numbers because they, not the, but they, um, 
but oh, I'm sorry, because the derivative, I thought I was going to say they make it, but actually I'm saying because the derivative is zero at those values. Okay, now here's another function, x squared uh, minus 4x to the two-thirds power. Now this function, when you take the derivative, will actually have a denominator. So you'll have a numerator will actually be 4 times x minus 2, and then the denominator will be 3 times x squared minus 4x to the 1 third. All right, so first of all, let's focus on how the derivative would be 0. Let's set the derivative equal to 0. Okay, so the only way a fraction can be 0 is if the numerator is 0 and the denominator is not. So I just need to set the numerator equal to 0 and solve it. So if you solve this, you get 4 times x minus 2 equals 0. So the only way that can be true is if x minus 2 equals 0 or x equal 2. So x equal 2 is a critical number because the derivative is 0 at x equal 2. But since this has a denominator, there's actually... Uh, a way that this derivative is undefined. Remember, if the denominator is 0, the, derivative, the uh, function is undefined, in this case, the derivative. Okay, so let's see what makes the denominator 0. Well, if I divide everything by 3, then that would get rid of this 3 right here, so I'd have uh, 0 in the denominator. I mean, I'd have the 3 gone. Okay, now this is a cube root to the one-third power. So if you wanted to eliminate the cube root, you could actually raise both sides to the third power. But if you raise both sides to the third power, on the left it's just going to eliminate the root and give you what's inside, x squared minus 4x. And of course, 0 cubed is just 0. Well, then you can factor this into x and x minus 4. And so when you solve that, you get x equals 0 or x equal 4. So basically we get two numbers where the uh, denominator uh, is 0. So that means we have two numbers where this function is undefined. So x equals 0 and 4 are critical numbers because the derivative is undefined at those values. Now let me remind you if you go back and actually plug 0 and 4 in here um, the function is defined at those values because this is actually the cube root quantity squared. So if you so you can actually take the cube root of any number and you can square any number. So so it really doesn't matter what you get if you plug zero or four back into the function uh, at this time. I just want you to realize that the function is defined at these numbers zero and four. So they are eligible to be critical numbers. All right now. Let's do one more. This function here is a another, uh, this one's a rational function. And if when I took the derivative of this using the quotient rule, I got the derivative was x times x minus 6 over x minus 3 quantity squared. Well, if you set this equal to 0, the only way it can be 0 is if the numerator is 0. So um, the only way the, the numerator can be 0, I'm not sure where this came from. Okay. Oh, wait, that's the denominator, my bad. That's actually underneath this. Okay, so we set the numerator equal to 0, okay, and then solve it. And so you get x equals 0 for this, and then if you solve this, this will lead to uh, x equals 6. Okay, so 0, 6 are critical numbers because the derivative is 0 at those values. Now, you may look at the derivative and say, well, wait a minute. I thought you said that any number that makes the derivative undefined is a critical number. Okay, well, what makes the derivative undefined? 3, because 3 is going to give me 0 in the denominator. Okay, well, you're right that 3 makes the derivative undefined. But 3 also makes the original function undefined. And remember, it says it, you can't have a critical number unless the original function is defined at the value. So 3 
it's it's an important value, and we'll talk about it later, but it's not by definition a critical number. So the only critical numbers here we have are 0 and 6. Now, one of the reasons that we're interested in these critical numbers is because if you go back to this picture, when a function is increasing, its derivative is positive. So when this function is increasing from negative infinity to 1, the derivative is positive. See, it would have to have a positive rate of change. The function would have to have a positive rate of change. And when a function is decreasing, so on this piece, f was decreasing, so that tells me the derivative must be negative. Okay? And then, of course, if the derivative, if the function is constant, then the derivative must be zero over that interval. But what I want to focus on is just two things here. And let me just show you a quick example. Okay, so look at this function here. See, on the left, let's say this number here is x equals c. This point right here is x equals c. Notice on the left, the function is increasing. And on the right, the function is decreasing. So notice that in order for it to change from increasing to decreasing, the graph had to have a slope of 0 at some point there. So for it to change from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa, I could have wrote it the other way as well, it had to, it had to go through an area where the slope is 0. So basically at this value, f prime is 0 at x equals c. So that's important. It's important to find that critical number so that we can determine where a function changes direction. Now, the only other way a graph can change direction is if the derivative is undefined. For example, this V-shaped function, you have a sharp corner down here. So at this point, we'll say that this is x equals c. Well, this function, the derivative would be undefined here at this point. And so, so in other, other words, notice it changes from decreasing to increasing at that point. So where can a function change a direction? It can change direction when you get a horizontal tangent line or the derivative is zero, or it can change direction when the derivative is undefined at a point. So those are the two places where a function can change direction, and that's why we're interested in those critical values. And that's why we set the derivative equal to zero to find uh, where you get a horizontal tangent line, and then we determine where the derivative is undefined to see where it might um, change direction at a sharp corner. Okay, so real quickly, those three functions I went over, remember we had a critical number here at zero and one, and notice that if you graph this at zero, you're going to get a horizontal tangent line right here, and it changes from increasing to decreasing. You can see it in the picture. Here, horizontal tangent line here, it changes from decreasing to increasing. Over here, uh, at this point, you get a horizontal tangent line, and it changes from increasing to decreasing. Now notice here, at these values, these two values were where the derivative was undefined. See the sharp corners? So those sharp corners, those critical numbers, notice it changes from decreasing to increasing there, and then at 4 it changes from decreasing to increasing. And then finally, over here, the third one, we got a critical number at 6, and see we have a horizontal tangent line at 6, and we got a critical number at 0, and see we get a horizontal tangent line at 0. Now, you see why we didn't get a, a critical number at 3, because see, 3, at 3 we get a vertical asymptote, so there's not even a point defined for this function at x equals 3. So those critical numbers are important, Again, because they show us where a graph changes from increasing and decreasing or decreasing and increasing. Now, a graph does not always turn around at a critical number, we'll, but we'll see that critical numbers are the only place that the graph can turn around. So I'll finish up this section with a second video.